oppression. I believe we re resist because we are oppressed. Without oppression, there would be no need to resist. And I personally grew up with many different facets of oppression, and I think it just happened naturally for me to rebel against that. By declaring myself, by identifying myself as a feminist, I'm making a statement that I'm resisting patriarchy. By identifying myself as a queer anarchist, I'm resisting against hierarchies of control and the heteronormative patriarchal gender binaries. And resistance means that I am awake and that I will no longer be complicit in the oppressive system. And also, Camus has this really great quote that I completely agree with and aligns with the topic of our discussion on resistance. Um, he said, the only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your very existence becomes an act of rebellion. And that is why I exist. I exist to resist. On resistance, there you have it, six of my comrades. They mentioned a lot of different concepts. I, I just want to touch on specifically because it is the the thing that kind of brought us together was was occupying um, occupying as a concept, <coughs> occupying as, a, as an act of resistance. Um, I wanted to open up stacks and kind of get people's thoughts on what I guess the goal of of, of occupy was as, as a tactic, um, and, and where the movement now is as a resistance. Um, so I just want to open up stacks. We'll be taking progressive stack, which is this um, concept uh, around horizontalism that uh, allows all voices to kind of be heard equally. So um, the progressive stack will elevate voices that are normally marginalized, whether they be women or queers or anything that's perhaps not like this, which is like a heterosexual man. But um, yeah, stacks are open to, to discuss what exactly the plan is. Yeah, when I want to put it, you can use it in a bit of a Yeah. 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 Y
be in space by, by pushing out those walls of, of public space was able to to do that, you know, to, to do that direct action of, of resistance simply by by talking with one another, which is something you know Americans have kind of forgotten how to do. And that's on set and on the ground. So occupying the primary goal of occupying is to practice the theory that and the rhetoric that we already have sort of pre-existing opinions about. And it's very difficult for people to sort of check uh, what they've been force-fed by the system before they enter into a communal space. You know? so okay, don't take your seat, I'm sorry. Occupying inevitably becomes is collectivization of ideas and sort of like cooperation in implementing those ideas and sort of like prefiguring the world within a within a small bubble within capitalism obviously the very act of occupying does not destroy the systems that bind us but it is still a an alternative structure and i think that resistance um, is also a two-pronged approach where we simultaneously smash the uh, state apparatus and create alternatives for people to coexist and live without sort of oppression and uh, aggressive behavior and dominance and that, that sort of thing. So it's, a, it's also the Occupy movement in Occupy LA was a way to express sort of anarchic theory and uh, socialistic theory and capitalistic uh, theory that like has never actually been seen before because we live under capitalism. Let's stream in your hands. But it looks so cool on here, watch. That was really great, that is really great about the Africa movement, is that it, it kind of puts together all of the grievances of the left. I feel like the left is really factored into a lot of identity politics, whether it's like anti-war, or gay rights, or a variety of all like uh, environmental rights, all of these things that were kind of seen as separate issues. and. What Occupy was was kind of this conglomeration of everybody. Like, you know, you can occupy them if your issue was the environment or if your issue was queer rights. And I think that's, you know, that's what we all, as the left, people who, everyone, and should be everyone, who finds that there's something wrong with the system, we all need to get this together and figure out the alternatives and work together and organize. Um, because that's the only way that we're going to be able to smash this oppressive system is by actually working together. And occupy for the general assemblies, for having to live together on the, on the lawn of uh, City Hall Park, it enabled us to actually start working what is that? Looks good. and create a reality, which is yeah. not always is really good? pretty, but mm -hmm. um, I think that's something that, again, our mainstream media makes us very that's individualistic and also yeah. forces us to not, you know, to kind of sweep aside sort of the <coughs> ugliness of what our world is because we have <coughs> ugliness within capitalism and poverty. And, and all that, and so, um, you know, and I think we need to all recognize that and start working together to create a better world. Ah, there you have it, uh, on resistance. Thank you all, you guys are, you guys are great comrades. Uh, we're going to take a short break and be back with a discussion on patriarchy, and instead of uh, being the divide and conquer class of breath, we're going to see how those ideas uh, work together, how they are inherently connected with capitalism, and, uh, and see what kind of connections we can make. I'll be back after a short break. KPFA would like to thank the following generous food donors for donating during our recent mini drafts with Verdugo Coffee Roasters of Burbank. Burbank's only sustainably operated office coffee stores. Check them out at VerdugoCoffee.com. Fatties on Eagle Rock Boulevard in Eagle Rock. Thanks to Odie, glad you're back. Pete's Coffee on Lake in Pasadena. Check out the new easy modded store and say hello to Vanessa. Western Vegas on Ventura in Studio City. Hey, now, so we're listening to KPFK uh, radio station. Uh, there's some occupiers doing a pilot program. Do you guys, what's the name of the program? Do you guys know? Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, it's a uh, pilot program that they're they're trying out to see uh, see how well it works, and um, I don't know. I think it's pretty awesome. What do you guys think? Yeah, yeah, I really I really like it. Um, I don't know. I really don't. I think well, I think some of us. I know it's disgusting. It's very effective. What is it? It's gross. It's like a wood sage. 
It's a wood version of sage. I've had it before. All right. Roundtable discussion. This week's topic we're going to be discussing patriarchy. We've got five kind of key questions to go over. I've got six of my comrades here in the studio with me. To my left is Anthony. And this is Smells very good. Mikey, That's the wood version of holy wood, I think it's called. Question, What's it called again? So the first question is, what is patriarchy? I'm going to open up stacks and see how this conversation goes. What is patriarchy, everyone? First on stack is Eddie, go ahead. I feel that patriarchy is a social system of organization in which men dominate and power over and children, usually young women and children of property. Carol is next on stack. Patriarchy is something that affects both men and women, and while men are more privileged back? within our patriarchal yeah, culture, okay. men who don't fit the dominant narrative of what a man is supposed to be, do space? still do not benefit from it as Thank much you. as men do fit it to. Men who are white, heterosexual, tall, the sort of thing that you see <laughs> on mainstream media, that's the patriarchy that men are not able to access to emulate, and a lot of um, men can't fit that thing. Sure. So, do you want to hold this or? It's okay if you don't want to, I can stop streaming. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Let's see if I can get out. I can't turn off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like, you know, you have a lot of men 
I'm also just working on deconstructing it within myself and not trying to be a certain thing so that I can get some sort of approval from men or look a certain way and not try to compare myself to what society and what is like pushed for what women are supposed to look like and really being able to just be comfortable in my own skin and be comfortable with my own body and my hair the way I want to wear it and I feel like little things like that that I'm like how you do it. Candace talked about comfortable with her skin, comfortable with her own hair, we talked about media, products, clothing. How does this idea of patriarchy relate with capitalism? Most of us are declared anti-capitalist. So how do these two concepts pair together? And I think patriarchs are the quintessential capitalists. I mean, I think patriarchs are people who enslave humanity for profit in order to get ahead and order to get some sort of paper artifact that has them like certain prestige in society and they get fancy things and cars. I think patriarchy and capitalism are interrelated because men who did what they did and then entered into the privileged class, they did so by enslaving women. They did so by enslaving Oh, why is it so People cold? It is cold! I'm getting cold hold in this stream. All the pressure is going from the top to the bottom. And so people emulate these patriarchs, these white, old, privileged men that <laughs> white are old in the men. upper echelons of society. People emulate those figures in order to white become them. So, oh, wrinkled ass man. Is with with money. The next one's tag is Eddie. I think that with these yeah. ideas provided for us, like the beauty standard, it's a market, the beauty standard that's in America. And everyone knows that sex sells, but how far is it going to go space, into like, like following these like, ideas of what beauty is, or what a male is supposed to be, or what a woman is supposed to be. And it works so much huh? in tandem with capitalism. They provide these kind of images uh, and the frameworks of how people are supposed to be and how are supposed to live, and then they sell. Well, how well, they did establish the negative uh, effect of nature. Yeah, but we enjoy those things. I already had this argument with him, but I don't want to hear what he wants to say. Through a direct action. What is direct action? Carol. Direct action, I think it's a complicated concept, but for me, what direct action means is pretty much almost any action, no matter how little it is, which is an act of resistance, of actually standing up against the status quo. Um, and when we're talking about smashing patriarchy and how direct action does that, it's standing up against patriarchy. So, and resisting that every day, regardless of whether that's, as Emma talked about, just checking a man on the word check, or you know, doing a bigger direct action, like taking the streets. There's different things that direct action is, but it can be something that you can do in your daily life as a resistance. So direct action is resistance. We need to resist patriarchy like every day yeah. by making sure that whenever anyone okay. says anything patriarchal or oppressive, that we're checking them on that and not allowing that patriarchal mm -hmm. culture to continue. I understand that as an individual, yeah. I'm not in any way affecting the world at large, but I yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's so beautiful though. I mean, it, this is what they're afraid of. This is what they have to kick them out of the park. To avoid oppressive language or like seeing each other as Yeah, we need six cops for people playing with Play Doh listening to the radio. I feel like it's like an Oh, reading, that's dangerous. I particularly have demonstrated incorrect actions. In a few minutes, we'll be taking your phone calls at 818-985-5735. So call in and join the discussion about patriarchy, how you smash it, how you think you smash it. The next on staff. I just also wanted to briefly say that it's also about representing a marginalized voice as a way to organize anti-capitalist direct action. For example, in Oakland, they had a chant like, we're here, we're here, bitch, if it's vacant, let's take that. Right? And that was a representation of the queer voice in the movement being there to support a already organized direct action. You know, I think lots of groups sort of feedback off of pre-organized rallies and pre-organized events that don't 
necessarily address the broader concerns of smashing yeah. patriarchy, totally but they are the part, entry point for people to begin discussing patriarchy. Yeah. And I think that that's important to everyone who voices. In terms of entry points, I know on um, Riverside there is a slut walk action this weekend. Do you guys want to talk about that? Talk about how that is the dress action or perhaps isn't. Uh, Emma. Slut walk Riverside is the Saturday and the whole idea behind slut walk is to reclaim the word slut in our patriarch, the rape culture, which yeah, includes slut shaming by referring to women who enjoy having sex as sluts. And also blaming the rape victim, saying she should have been behaving more appropriately and dressed not like a slug, and maybe she asked for it. And there's a lot of, it's a dominant narrative within our culture that we tend to blame the women for a lot of our actions instead of taking accountability or responsibility and demanding the men stop rape instead of asking the women to prevent rape themselves. Slut walk is going to be this Saturday at 1.30 in front of the downtown Riverside Public Library. And also, this Saturday is Women's Equality Day. And the women organized to resist and defend the word organization, they called out for a national day of action. So it'll be a national effort to defend women's rights. And that's going to be on the corner of Hollywood and Vine at 1 p.m. this Sunday. Last on stack before we go to uh, phone calls is Carol. Final thoughts. The whole thing behind Slut Walk is that a lot of times as a woman you're told if you get raped, you're sexually assaulted, that you get blamed for it and it's because like, oh, it's something that you wore. So the point of Slut Walk is women were resisting by not following that. And they're like, I'm going to wear whatever I want to wear because what I wear shouldn't be the reason a man should rape me. And I think that's really important. I've been told that as a woman, I need to take a self-defense class in order to protect myself. But what I say to that is that men should really learn to not rape. You know, I need to protect myself. Men should learn to not rape women. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you all very much. We're going to take a short break and then take your phone calls. Again, that number is 818-985-7835. What does drinking in the street have to do with rape? Saturday night from 2 to 4 a.m. People get blamed for the drink. Yeah. Yeah. What does getting laid more have to do with rape? People will get laid more. But what does getting laid have to do with rape? I don't know. Rape, rape is actually a, a, a sense of, of domination and control that really have to do with people not getting laid. It's not like a desperation thing, I don't think. It's more of a... I want to take advantage of you. I want to hear you scream and cry. And, you know, I want to feel like I have that, you know, power. Power, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Isn't that just like, isn't that just an exaggeration, uh, mass, mass exaggeration? Well, uh, welcome back. This is on resistance. This is a long night facilitating the conversation. Uh, we're taking your phone calls now. And the first call is Bill from Tinder. Males are expected to be dominant. Females are expected to be submissive. So isn't that just blown up ten times? Um, the, uh, the next car is going to be Rochelle from Rancho. Uh, Rochelle, are you there? I'm here. Uh, how are you? I'm here, thank you. Uh, what you well, I'm used to well, I wanted a little clarification because I'm so cute. Yeah. I can hear. Yes, I can hear. Yes, I can hear. 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 That's kind of confusing for me. And the other thing is, I, uh, I've i never, ever heard anybody ever say that they were offended by being referred to as a chick. And in fact, I hear women refer to each other all the time as a chick. Uh, however, you know, there are other derogatory uh, remarks and names that women use with each other. And they call it terms of endearment. Um, but uh, so it's not worse to me. I just cannot. I just don't understand where the kick thing is, it's a bad thing. And I wish you could clarify whether or not the slut is to be okay. I'm not I, I, it's really hard to hear. Uh, absolutely, that's a great question, talking about reclamation of words. Uh, first on track is the person that made that trick reference, uh, Emma. Hi, um, so 
the fact that we are confused about the usage of the word chick and um, I think is what's wrong with the dominant narrative. It's because it's so normalized that we don't even question it and we as women pick up on that habit too. And I think a lot of us who have been resisting recently have also used that term in the past and we're in the process of deconstructing ourselves to, to not use that word anymore because it's degrading to women to refer to women as an animal and um, in comparison to the word slut that's been used to um, degrade women and for so long that um, slut walk as an action is actually reappropriate in the term that we are not um, we're not that word is that gonna bother us because it it defines us in a certain way and that we're not ashamed of that anymore and we're pretty much reclaiming the word and I think well you know what I disagree with you I um I don't know what time we're leaving but we need to be at the place where we usually are at two o'clock to get the money for the bus and then I don't know uh, what time, we'll have to check the bus. I don't know what bus we need to take. So we'll have to check on that and figure it out. Already been used to degrade women. I think most, like that's why you know you're saying slut is as. Uh, um, Can you hold this? Yeah. Yeah. We also know that it's on the narrative, and that's what they're going to reclaim it. So what? It doesn't fit. Like mo a lot of like the first time I see him, I brought that up. No one has said anything? Well, uh, thank you, Rochelle. We just had five people get on stack, and that's everyone in this radio studio to respond. <laughs> uh, that will be a bigger conversation, which we can continue online in Tumblr. We want to get through a couple more phone calls. Um, our Tumblr is onresistance.tumblr.com. Looks kind of blurry. And our, our email, we can already keep the conversa conversation going. Oh! That's how you know I'm not a last year. The first one that failed, uh, Phil Santa Ana, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, welcome to Welcome to On Resistance. Thank you for having this program. Um, I've been involved with the last five pretty much from the beginning, or the beginning out here, when we had to take March in Irvine and also in Santa Ana a couple weeks later. And one thing I think that is unfortunately missing <coughs> is that uh, you have a fairly narrow spectrum of progressive, fairly clean, blockchain conditions. And it's not going to disagree with any of them. It's just that we have quite a few people in this case from very different situations Maya. who are in agreement to the agreement, which is not conventional. So, and that was really the hard to occupy, as far as I was concerned, and as far as I'm concerned, it's still really the hard to occupy is the list of grievances from the Wall Street Organization. So I'd like you to address how we can widen that fence, not to narrow it down to the point that uh, you hear the same voices talking to the same people, but to bring in people. Like we had people from the Ron Paul movement, we had people from the Libertarian. And those people were in the right to agree about the grievances. All right, first on stack to address that is uh, Anthony. Uh, hi, I'm Anthony. Um, <laughs> I, just, I wanted to say that. I just want to say uh, that. I, think, uh, I don't know. I'll have to learn more about it. I don't know what's going on. This room can uh, pretend to know what the Occupy movement is really about. Uh, you know, but it's probably more along the lines of communicating with each other about our concerns with the horrible way that society is structured right now. Uh, no matter what side of the political apparatus that we stand on, um, everyone thinks that the current way of economics, of politics, of, of uh, 
social interactions is like not okay anymore and we need to change it or it's just going to get worse and um i think that the two-part system was created by you know capitalists in order to divide us um and i think that i think that when you break it down in terms of horizontalism um, the left and the right are conservative and liberal conservatism and liberalism are actually more along the lines of a circle rather than a spectrum um, so I mean I think the, I don't think anyone in this room is uh, trying to speak for Occupy speak about what Occupy is about we're just uh, six people sitting in a room together talking about our beliefs and our principles uh, yeah, just to kind of clarify, I think what Phil's question is, you know, how to grow a movement um, on the left, that, that is a, a legit question. Um, I didn't want to get on stuff and just talk about conceptually, of, is, is resistance growing, um, and how do, you, how do you grow that? Well, it's a uh, it's group out here in Orange County, uh, called, uh, and, and nationwide, I understand, called the Voice of Truth. Want to go on there? Yes, you are. And they hold a... Uh, little festival, Sounds of Truth, in Irvine a few months ago, and they got mostly occupied people, but they got people from all, all over the spectrum, and their concept was to bring people together and identify what they agreed upon, and they got an amazing amount of agreement between these different groups, I mean, people from Occupy were startled, you know, they found themselves talking to somebody from the Tea Party, for example, <laughs> and they were able to convert. And they were able to identify common ground. So this is what I'm, I'm trying to point to, is that we need to avoid narrowing our focus to the point that we're losing people. We need to start figuring out how to bring people in and convince them that our ideas are right. Uh, all right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks both. Got two people on stack uh, to address you. Um, Emma, you first. I think what the Occupy movement did successfully is to bring people who care about these grievances, which are very large and broad, and there's a lot of issues that we still want to address. And um, what it created after a lot of the encampments were raided nationwide and worldwide, what remained were pockets all over the world who continued to organize within their communities. And um, I understand that there's a lot of um, maybe the dominant, like maybe the people who are organizing the most seem you know more like personal to to their ideals than the whole occupy movement was but not having that encampment of, of space where a lot of different voices come together we're kind of forced to form affinity groups with people who share our ideals and focus on specific in issues within our community one by one and I, I don't think the grievances are being ignored. I think grievances are being addressed in many different ways all over the world in different pockets of resistances. Uh, last on stack is Carol, then we'll take an under power. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, um, I think that there is a lot of things that we have in similar with other people like the Tea Partiers and so on. But, um, I think, no, I don't, you know, I'm not here to represent the Occupy movement. I'm here as someone who um, is resisting. And I want to, you know, I want to push the envelope away just from these sort of set political mainstream um, narratives. Um, and I think by, you know, talking about patriarchy and really critically um, assessing everything in our world and really talking about how our entire culture is really, is really sick. And that it's not just because, like, oh, if we get somebody else elected in office, then that's going to change. It's not. It's really much more deeply rooted in that. And we need to start having that conversation that this isn't just about, like, grievances. This is really about a really deep-rooted, systematic, structural problem that has existed for a while. And um, the solution is not going to be easy, and it's not going to come tomorrow. It's going to take a lot of organizing and talking and discussing and also pushing the envelope and questioning everything and anything we've ever been uh, thank you, thank you for your phone call, Phil. Uh, next caller is Tiffany. Tiffany, welcome to On Resistance. Hey, thank you very much. Um, glad to speak. Uh, my name is Tiffany. I represent uh, Revolutionary Socialist Organization, Struggles United, Lucha Feminist, as well as the October 22nd Coalition. 
And one of the things that I wanted to connect with patriarchy is discussion is also police She doesn't represent October 22nd coalition. She doesn't. Sorry. And as Otto said, the challenging dominant narratives, and that's really significant and important, we're also seeing a backlash from that from the cops. And they're using various techniques in order to silence different marginalized groups who are taking the chance um, and speaking out against it. And one of the ways they did that with the cops is through sexual assault at Occupy movements and um, at actions. And you saw this with Occupy Wall Street in its early stages where the cops just sprayed those three women who were standing behind the barricade doing nothing. You know, we saw in Seattle the pregnant woman who miscarried because she got pepper sprayed. And the elderly woman, one of our elders, who was eight years old and got pepper sprayed as well. You know, they're using different tactics to target different people. And it's even as though a lot of the face of police brutality has been, you know, of black people. And, and Peter Wilson is the abuse of the Grant or Rodney King um, and Devin Brown and various other people who have been killed. And now, you know, the man who was handcuffed in the back of a police car, they took to get The coroner didn't even check his res residue for a gun cut on his hand. We've seen that. You know, and, and, and even though it's not talked about enough, people aren't seeing the face of police brutality as white women or as disabled people of color, like John T., a deaf man who was killed in Seattle, Washington. That's, that's a fantastic so, connection, Tiffany. That's a fantastic. Just a direct response from uh, from Eddie here in the studio. Uh, well, I wasn't. If, yeah, you can you can finish. You can. You can, you can finish, Sydney. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I'm not going to take up too much more time. Anyway, I just wanted to say that with that, those things happening, and, and with Kelly Thomas and Ferguson as well, that we're seeing that all those people who have been marginalized in society, everyone who gets beat down by the police, the LGBTQ community, women, people of color, the disabled, immigrants by ICE, you know, we're seeing those, those voices coming together, and Occupy was a, a great way to centralize activism and to make the argument and discussion about class struggle more public, because we didn't see that until the WTO 99 Seattle. So, you know, I wanted to say that those connections between patriarchy and police brutality are happening, but that the people are organizing and that is happening in communities all over the country, all over the world, and that we stand in solidarity internationally with the women of Egypt as well, and with women in Chile, and the students there too. Um, so that is really what my point was, and to making that connection. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we've got a lot of power fists in the room for what you're saying. Um, <laughs> I think it's interesting to look at uh, the history of uh, you know, the police institution. Everybody it's extremely out. patriarchal and inherently racist. And if you're looking, you know, in, in terms of like reforming something that is like inherently oppressive, you're not really going to go too far. Um, I would say, um, yeah, a lot of police uh, use use this kind of uh, sexual violence as a tactic, as a war tactic, it's very, very still much prevalent in our society today. And um, uh, I would say, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to sexism and when it comes to property, it's like most people would know that the police aren't there to protect and serve the, the general people. I would say they're they're more for social control and the protecting of property. And if you look at their history and viewing women and children and black people as property, as you know, an an, an institution, um, uh, you're you're still going to see that today. What happened to the radio? Oh, it makes me want to go. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sounds like they were having some problems. Yes, we can hear oh. you right. Hello. <laughs> okay, well, I need to archive. I'll be back in like one minute.